Welcome to episode 14 of Monster Kid Radio, the podcast where we celebrate the classic and not-so-classic genre cinema of yesteryear. I am Derek M. Cook. I want to welcome you to part two of our third week of our Ray Harryhausen series here on Monster Kid Radio. This is the final episode in our Harryhausen series, and I want to say thank you to Stephen D. Sullivan, Scott Morris, and Edward J. Russell for joining me for this Harryhausen retrospective. That was kind of unplanned. You see, for several months before the launch of Monster Kid Radio, I was collecting recordings, gathering chats with people to put on the show, and these Harryhausen discussions kind of happened without planning. It was actually before Harryhausen himself had passed. Since he's passed, we decided to go ahead and put all these episodes together into one long series. The B Movie Cast had the same idea, so if you want more Harry House of Goodness, head over to the B Movie Cast. There will be a link in the show notes to Vince's podcast. Go check out what they're doing over there. They're diving into some more Harry House and films, some that we haven't covered here on the show. Think it's a great time to be a Harry House and fan, but a sad time as well since the man did pass. But as Stephen D. Sullivan has said on a couple of different shows, he's left us a wonderful legacy and wonderful artwork to look back on and just remember his contribution to genre cinema overall. We are finishing up our talk about 20 Million Miles to Earth with Edward J. Russell in this episode of Monster Kid Radio. I hope you guys enjoy the chat. The music you heard at the beginning of the episode was the song Zombie Harem from the band Daikaiju. It's from their album Phase 2, and it appears on this episode of Monster Kid Radio by permission of the band. You'll hear the song in its entirety at the end of the show. Remember, you can find links to Daikaiju, Edward J. Russell's books, anything else that we talk about here on the show over on our website at monsterkidradio.net. Our contact information is over there as well, including our phone number, 503-479-5MKR, or our email address, monsterkidradio at gmail.com. Also, remember, we're on Facebook, and I've had some people ask me, how can they listen to Monster Kid Radio if they don't use iTunes? Well, obviously, if you're listening to this show now and you don't use iTunes, you've already figured it out. But if you have a friend who wants to listen to the show and they don't use iTunes and you can't figure out how to do it, there's a couple different ways. We are in the Stitcher directory, so if you have Stitcher on your smartphone, you can find us there. You can also go to our behind-the-scenes, bare-bones, no-bells-and-whistles website over at monsterkidradio.libsyn. Dot com And that's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. They're our host, and we have a very bare-bones website set up through them. Of course, if you want all the bells and whistles, the Flickr page, the YouTube stuff, everything else we do, monsterkidradio.net is where it's at. After the chat, stick around, because I'm going to tell you about a movie that I've been watching this past week, and I'm going to announce the contest that I've teased you about in the last episode. We'll get to that after our chat with Edward J. Russell right now. All right, man. Yeah, you know, I really liked this movie. It was fun to watch. Um, you, we've talked a couple of times between the black and white versus the color version, and you've mentioned the commentary. So you've got this on disc. Okay. Yes. They, they came out with a 50th anniversary. It's a two-disc set, and it's got everything you could want, including uh, an in- interview between um, Harry Well, Tim Burton, who has sort of taken the modern-day reigns from – Harryhausen and, and making the stop motion, he sits down and has a conversation with Harryhausen. And, you know, that alone is worth the price of the disc, which I, I'm pretty sure is under yeah. 20 bucks. I think I picked it up for like 10 somewhere. Nice. So you can, you can watch it in either the original black and white or the colorized. And, and to me, the colorization of this looks much more natural than some of the earlier movies that they, um, or the earlier attempts at colorizing films. Right. Yeah. He, where it's got that kind of washed over mm-hmm. look. Mm-hmm. Harry Housen was involved in the colorization process and all these that he uh, either approved or signed off on or actually sat in the, sat in the uh, computer bay with them while they were doing the colorization. So he had a lot of input on that, especially when it came to making sure his creatures looked right. But I, I was pretty impressed with the colorization as well. That, and, mm-hmm. you know, I, I started watching it in color and I'm thinking, was it originally shot in color? Because there's a lot of stuff in here that actually looks good. It doesn't have that fake kind of cheesy colorization look. No, it was originally black right. and white, and that was because of some sort of grain mm-hmm. issue. He talks about that in the commentary. Sure, yeah, and you know, I thought it looked great in color. It, it really works in this one. I, I like seeing the creature green. Yeah, you know, of course, it's a, an alien from another world or whatever. It's got to be a green, you know, 
you know, monster. And, and I thought it looked really good. It, it had a, a slightly unnatural green to it. You know, it didn't look like, you know, any other, other lizard like green that we're used to seeing here on our planet, but it was right. still realistic enough that, you know, just it walked that fine line between being fantastic, but still living and breathing. In my opinion, it looks more real than the elephant. Yeah. Uh, we do see a, a stop motion elephant and there is a stop motion man as well. Oh, there's a couple yeah, of them. And I think the Emir looks best. And I was wondering about the elephant. I wonder if it's because we're so used to seeing elephants on TV or in movies or whatever that we have something to compare it to. Whereas with the Emir, I mean, I don't know about you, but I haven't been to Venus in a while. So I haven't seen one of those in a long time, you know? Okay. I'll, I'll grant you that. But I just thought the elephant was a little clunky. It, it doesn't seem to move as much as it you would yeah. think it would during the battle. Yeah. So, but the Amir is fantastic for the win. I mean, you know, we, we talked about the actors and the actresses, at least the ones that really kind of caught of our attention in this thing, but really the, the star of the thing is the Amir. Yes. And Harry house and himself, actually speaking of people in the movie, he has a cameo in this. Okay. I missed uh, that. You know, I remember hearing about it years ago, but then never really went back to go look for it. But who's feeding the elephant in the zoo. Oh, I never so, realized this, that. So, darn. We'll have to go back and watch it again. Yeah. <laughs> That one got by me. Now, you said that this is something that, you know, you watched all the Harry Harryhausen's growing up. Uh, and so you've seen them all, this one, you know, the Sinbad movies, things like that. When was the first time you saw this one? Uh, I, it was just yeah. a kid. Pretty sure it would have been on a Sunday afternoon uh. when the, the uh, classic movies came out. And they, they played a lot of the Harryhausen's. This would have been one of them that played on a Sunday afternoon. And, you know, it's what formed my love for this genre. It definitely has that after weekend matinee kind of feel. It's yes. perfect. I mean, they hit you at that time, you know? But the thing is, this movie really, even though there are a lot of problems with the plot, and, and the, the whole tale really doesn't go much of anywhere, the pacing in this is very well done. You never really get bored. It, you don't ever doze off on this movie like you can with a lot of movies that are from that era. It does, happen, it does have a good pace. Uh, the pacing, it's pretty quick. We don't spend a lot of time in any one scene or scenario. I mean, we're, we're there, moving on to the next piece, moving on to the next piece, moving on to the next piece. And even though the highlight of the movie is the Emir destroying Rome, I never felt anxious waiting for that to happen. How, how you can get sometimes with these big monster like movies, you know, we talked about Godzilla sometimes with the, some of the Godzilla movies. I love them, but until Godzilla shows up and starts wrecking stuff, you're like, Oh, come on now. Really? Come on now. Let's get to Godzilla with this one. I never felt that. Yeah. It takes forever to get to him. You get the Emir right away. I mean, you get hints of it as soon as the uh, ship goes down with the kid finding the canister and you can see there's something in there. Mm hmm. And I always wondered why the zoologist, as soon as they find the Emir, once it's popped out, you know, his first move is, okay, well, let's throw it in a cage. All right, I'm going I to know, bed. I know. I was just about to mention that. Didn't that seem weird to you? Like, I would be up all night trying to feed this thing and studying it. Yeah. We'll put him in the cage outside, put a tarp over it, and call it good. Really? Yeah. No. 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 <laughs> It's clearly something you've, I mean, yeah, I don't know if he would have thought it was an alien by the time when he first saw it, but yeah, you're right. I'd be up all night taking pictures, sketches, you know, notes, trying to feed it this or that. The book, trying to find any listing of anything similar. I mean, you've got something that looks reptilian that's walking upright mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of reptiles that do that. I know there's the one in Australia that runs, but this looks right. Bad. So yeah. And that's the whole point of, you know, zoology or the goal of at least everyone that I've ever met is to find a species and name it. Exactly. Right. That, that would have been the next thing, you know, well, clearly this is a brand new species that I've discovered. I get to name it. I'll name it after, you know, whatever. There would have been something, you know, take some blood. I don't know. Do something. But there's absolutely no. Yeah, he, he grabs those in the cage and goes yep. to bed. Like, All right. Thanks, daughter. Thanks for your help. <laughs> And then the next morning, they're just getting up and like, oh, good morning, Father. How are you? Oh, I'm going to go check on the cage. You know, <laughs> just like, that'd be the first. And the thing is doubled in size. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Let's take it to Rome. No, you take more. You do more. I, uh, whatever. I mean, he goes running off to town to look for Pepe for more information. I just, there was 
you know, we were just talking about how much the pacing works in this movie. There was a lack of immediacy or urgency when it came to the zoologist. Yeah, he doesn't seem to know where he's going with it. And it breaks out right away. I did find it kind of amusing that, to me, that cage he puts it in, that looks like a metal cage. And the Amir breaks out of it pretty easily. And so the the, the first time Hopper goes after it, they're going to put it in this rickety old wooden (laughs) cage that looks like something out of a gypsy camp. Well, I mean, in Hopper's defense, perhaps, I mean, they were used to dealing with them when they were smaller on Venus. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? (laughs) That's a stretch. I don't know. Yeah, half of the movie is them chasing this thing around all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, this is one of the few movies where, you know, in all the Godzillas and a lot of the other movies, they pull the guns out and they're shooting right away. Here they do hold off until they, you know, have to start shooting at it. And then they find out it's pointless. And that's another thing that's different. They're not constantly trying to shoot the thing once they find out that the bullets don't work. Like in the Godzilla movies, they know their bullets don't work, but they still shoot them anyway. Here, they kind of back off of that a little bit. Yeah, that's true. Until the Roman authorities are like, oh, we don't care. We want to kill it. And then they bust out the flamethrower. A flamethrower and a tank flamethrower. I've never seen that. I know, that right? Before. I was going to ask you about that. I've never seen that either, the, the the tank shooting the flames. I mean, I suppose it's possible. I'm sure they have them. But, yeah, I hadn't really seen them. And it's not tons of tanks. Just just, just a one. Just a couple. A couple helicopters. Yeah. The strangest looking net you've ever seen. <laughs> Looks more like a fence, but well, it had to conduct electricity, right? Which yeah. I thought was also an interesting little uh, uh, thing in this movie. You know, they have the anesthesiologist there trying to keep it under by running electricity through it constantly. Just the right. <laughs> you know, I, I've had to go, and you know, I've had some surgeries done over the years. I've never been put out by electricity. <laughs> now, and that scene still makes me laugh when 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 they get the net on the thing and they 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 hook it up. And they they essentially tase the Emir, and the way he just starts vibrating, yeah. probably shouldn't laugh, but that cracks me up every time <laughs> I see it. Even though I'm rooting for the Emir through most of that, just just the way he shakes and twitches is kind of yeah. Funny. No, and you know you said you're voting for the Emir, and that kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. There's a sense of empathy to this thing. I mean, it's not doing anybody any harm, or at least it doesn't want to. You know, we mentioned that lamb encounter. I almost got the impression that the emir was kind of freaked out by the lamb and didn't know what to do, and that's why it left. Man, you just feel bad for this thing. You know, it it does attack an elephant and such, but, you know, what would you do if you'd been electrocuted and uh, had a flamethrower shot at you a couple times? Prodded and probed? You're probably a little hungry. You got very little sulfur to eat. You know, like I said, I really enjoyed the movie. I liked coming back to it. Over the years, I mean, is this something that you've gone back to and watched every once in a while? You you have it on disc yourself, right? Yeah, uh, on occasion. I mean, there's so many movies that, that, that it's hard to go back, and you forget about things until you're reminded about them. And then you pull them out, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that was fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is one of those that fits that oh, yeah. category. You kind of laugh at some of the silliness. Like, like, like we mentioned before, that... It, it doesn't breathe, but yet you see it breathing. It rips out of a metal cage, but they try to put it in a wooden one. And, you know, they say it, it's not really dangerous unless you provoke it or it doesn't get ferocious until it's attacked. And they, yet they never leave it alone. <laughs> That's true. This is something I do something similar in, in my real life. I, I have to catch critters and I know how you corral them. And these guys are just terrible at it. <laughs> but. I like how we're going to leave that vague so the listeners will think that, oh, he has to catch critters. He's a cryptozoologist. You know, he's chasing, but no, you're an exterminator, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. But, you know, I, I do everything from, you know, the tiny little ants all the way up to, um, you know, right. vertebrates, coyotes and right. deer. I've even caught a chinchilla once. And, and I'm not trying to, you know, by saying, well, you're just an exterminator. I wasn't trying to downplay what you do. I just, you know, it's like, I have to catch critters. And I'm thinking, you know, yep, we're going to let listeners think Ed chases Bigfoot. That's what we're going to let him think. <laughs> or Emir's in this case, if he ever wants to go to Rome. I'll go after Emir's. Go. <laughs> not a lot of big feet here in uh, central Indiana. <laughs> we'll keep that in mind. <laughs> It's a Bigfoot free zone, so there's like a little sanctuary where we can go if there's ever a problem, right? Uh, yeah. A lot of deer, a lot of coyote, a few wolves, but. No and, and any Amirs? Not that I've seen. But I, I do have some uh, traps out there. Just well, see, there you are. You're messing with it now if you just leave it alone. Well, it's a passive. 
it's got a, you know, I've got some sulfur out there. If it comes looking for sulfur, maybe it'll crawl into the cage and then Get- believe me, I won't put it to put it in a cage and go to bed all night. I'll be taking pictures. It'll be all over That's right. Facebook. <laughs> uh, now you mentioned the Sinbad movies and such too. So you're more, you're more drawn to the Sinbad because of the adventure kind of stylings. Yes. Yeah. And you know, I know uh, that you go to Gen Con and things like that. So do you have a lot of role playing game in your background? Yeah. Like you said, it's the adventure, adventure aspect, the, the, the fantasy that comes into it. I mean, they always have a quest. They're always going after something. And along the way, they run into so many great creatures. That's It's just fun. It's not like their lives are being threatened and they're running from a beast the whole time. So it's a more, I don't want to say active, but it's a more fun process than the straight horror where, you know, they're running for their lives and yeah, screaming. Yeah, I mean, you, no, I think you're right. I think in, in a situation like that, and I think by saying it's active, you nailed it. But the Sinbad movies we're the ones in control. The people are in control because they're going on the adventure. And yeah, something might come up along the way, but it's still their adventure in a situation like this. We're dealing with some, you know, we're the reactors, you know, the Amir is loose. So I think, no, I think I could see the difference there. And you know, they're fun. We, we don't get a lot of fun movies right now. And what we do get is so lowest common denominator and so fast paced. There's just, not not any development. You don't really ever care about any. You don't really get a chance to just sit back and enjoy what's happening on screen, whether it's a you know a unique characterization or you know CGI monsters, which we talked about you know at the beginning of all this. Uh, I would put a Harryhausen monster on the screen next to a CGI monster on the screen, and and I could predict which one is going to draw the most empathy. I would think because there's just so much joy to that so much warmth to these these stop motion creations you know and we're we're calling the amir a monster and i even struggle with that because it's not just a monster it's a character it's got you know it's got fears we're we're chasing it around and it's reacting because we won't leave it alone like you said it never kills on its own it always is attacked first the only time that it it struck first really was when it threw the rocks or the bricks off of the top of the coliseum and even then, you know, they were, they were firing at it, even though they are abysmal shots. <laughs> they, they fire the bazooka like a 30 seconds after the thing is moved. But And the bazooka shots, I like they, they just seem to be like flare guns, really. You know, they, they hit the ground and there's this little burst of spark and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> you don't really see any damage. It just kind of falls down and clutches its stomach. You know, even area. though we did see like a little bit of blood on the elephant. Or on the stop motion man that it fights, we do see a little bit of blood on it, which I would imagine in black and white, you know, it wouldn't be this vibrant red. So I'm glad they didn't make it this vibrant, bloody thing when they went to color in this particular case. Yeah, in the, in the black and white, you you can't necessarily even tell because I, I, it's not until the elephant that the the emir tries to bite anything. Before that, it's really just punching and pounding. Right. No, you're absolutely right. It's rest with the elephant. For the most part, they're wrestling. Right. You know, towards the end of that fight with the elephant, it does start biting its neck or whatever. But yeah, you're right. It's just kind of a test of strength, really. You know, we mentioned that it does kill some people in, in the final chase, I suppose, when it's pushing rocks off of the Coliseum and throwing things around. And, <laughs> you know, this is another one of those silly moments that I had to kind of giggle a little bit because you could tell that there's this guy just outside the camera. You know, it's tossing these big fake rocks at people and then they would and they would catch yeah. the rock and then fall down. <laughs> well, the same thing with the chickens. Oh, yeah. You know, the chickens in the barn, they just come flying from off screen, you know, like 15 feet in the air landing mm-hmm. on the ground. You know, somebody's just out there just tossing them just outside of camera. Just tossing the chickens, <laughs> yeah. I, I want the chicken tosser job. You know, that's, that's what I, I I can't imagine anybody ever said that going to work in a movie. I want to be the chicken tosser. Well, they do it every week on oh, Sanguli. There you go. So, is this a movie that would have been covered on, like, on a Sanguli or a horror hosted show for you? I never saw it that way, but I'm sure it's something that he would he could have on. It his definitely show, has yeah. that feel, man. It totally could end up on a show like that. Although it is a Columbia picture, and I don't know what their thoughts are on you know, licensing that kind of stuff out. But yeah, I could totally see this turn up on a, a horror hosted program, you know, either back then or even today. Yeah, I think he's got mostly like yeah. Universal. Yeah, Universal puts so. those packages out all the time. You know, you know, 
it makes those available. But yeah, something like this, I can totally see like that. It was a lot of fun to revisit, man. I'm really glad you picked this one. I enjoyed talking about it with you and watching the film again. It, you know, it brought back memories. Indeed. All right. So, you know, at the beginning of all this, we talked about your books that are coming up. Uh, do you have a website somewhere people can find you online? Not really. I, there is a website out there for the, it's the dead infested.com, but it, that's really just a link to the book. Really. I don't have much of a web okay. presence. And it's the dead infested.com. Okay. All right. Yes. And of course people can find you on Amazon. Yeah. Both books are there. Like I said, the Kindle versions are really cheap. The print versions are a little more expensive. And we mentioned Gen Con. Do you go to Gen Con pretty regularly? Yeah, I've, I've been there every year for a number of years now, and I'll have a table there this year again where I'll be unveiling a super secret Ooh, project. nice. So. All right, so keep an eye out for Ed at Gen Con or find him online. If you run into him at a convention, tell him you heard him on Monster Kid Radio. Thanks for having me. Again, big thanks to Edward J. Russell for taking the time to do this. Head over to thedeadinfested.com to learn more about his debut zombie novel. Look him up on Amazon for his other book as well. And as we learn more about future projects, we'll definitely make sure we mention it here on the show. He's going to be at Gen Con, he said. So if you go to Gen Con, look him up until a Monster Kid Radio sent you. Speaking of former guests who have ongoing or new projects, Stephen D. Sullivan has launched Daigaiju Attack. Look that up on Facebook. He's got a group set up, and he's starting a Daikaiju serial, as in something you read, not something you eat. It's an ongoing story that has to do with giant monsters. I'm looking forward to it. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but man, that's what I'm doing this weekend to get myself ready to see Pacific Rim, which, well, if you're not excited for that, then I don't know. Anyway, moving on. I recently watched the 1959 film The Headless Ghost. Barely a feature-length film, just a little over an hour long, directed by Peter Graham Scott. It's billed as a comedy horror film. It's kind of like that. It's very light in terms of its horror. I think the scariest, probably the most monstrous part of the whole movie, well, there's two segments. The opening credits, which is a gorgeously animated title sequence, which shows a ghost running around without a head and then a head chasing it around. And you know, through the opening titles, you're watching the ghost try to catch his head. And then later on in the movie, at one point, you do see the floating head appear, and it's pretty cool. So the movie is about this group of tourists that are checking out these haunted castles and they go to the Ambrose estate where there's this legend of the headless ghost and all these other things. There's two Americans and then a foreign blonde bombshell who decide to stick around after the tour to learn more about the ghosts themselves. And they get caught up in this caper, this mystery, trying to reunite the head with the ghost and free the ghost from the curse. And, you know, it's, it's a fun movie. Again, it's kind of light, not overly scary, not overly serious, Richard Lyon and David Rose play the Americans in the movie. And Lillian Soten, which I may have mispronounced her last name, plays our blonde, who is kind of a romantic interest for the guys. There's not too much there. I mean, there's some heavy kissing, but that's about it. There is a seductive dance number that made me think this movie may not have been just aimed at the kids, because she does get, quite she being the dancer, gets very into her... Uh, gyrations shall we say i absolutely loved the music in the movie the music was by george sherman who you might know from the black museum films like that it was a fun movie kind of light the dvd is pretty bare bones not much going on there but it was a fun movie and i'm glad i watched it okay the contest how would you like to win a copy of the recently released white zombie blu-ray from kino classics this is a great Blu-ray release of this wonderful movie starring Bela Lugosi. Here's how you enter to win. Monster Kid Radio does not have a promo that we can share with other podcasts. So, if you create a promo for Monster Kid Radio that we can share with other podcasts, and it's the best one, you win a copy of this Blu-ray. It's that simple. This contest is going to go for a month. So the deadline is August 11th. The winning entry will become property of Monster Kid Radio, LLC. Any music that you use in the promo, you must have permission to use and can transfer that permission to use over to Monster Kid Radio, LLC. I can make the title music that we use here on Monster Kid Radio when we're not playing music provided by some other band available in the feed as well. In fact, watch the feed tomorrow. I'll put it out so that it's there. Would really like to incorporate that kind of surf, horror, rock feel that we try to have here on Monster Kid Radio 
at the top of the end of the show, if possible. So you have one month to create the audio promo that we can use. Most podcasts don't like to run their promos longer than a minute. Some like to go even shorter. So sometimes short and sweet's the way to go. Again, the winning promo will become property of Monster Kid Radio LLC. August 11th is the deadline to get the MP3 to me. Next week, we're going to get back into something a little bit more horror-related, but we're still going to laugh a little bit. We're going to talk about Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, and my guest next week will be Joe Stuber, who is who you might know from the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones segment over on the IndieCast. That's going to be a lot of fun. In fact, that chat was the first chat that I recorded for Monster Kid Radio, so I'm finally bringing that to the air. Really excited to share that with you guys and gals next week. Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio, LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio, LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivations, 3.0 unported license. Of course, that does not apply to the song Zombie Harem by the band Daikaiju, which appears on their album Phase 2. This song appears by permission of the band. See you next week. (laughs) 